Hi, I'm Hamish Black and welcome to Writing on Games. There's a scene near the start of Wolfenstein The New Order in which BJ is ruminating over his current situation from his wheelchair. He solemnly speaks of a temporal disconnect, of seasons passing in the blink of an eye, and trying to build a picture of his situation from scant, fleeting details over an indeterminate amount of time. It's a rather eerie image of a character who was once the original video game embodiment of a distinctly American machismo, asserting his nation's values in the thoroughly righteous cause of slaughtering every Nazi in his path. Now though, the roles are reversed and BJ is on the defensive. In thinking about the game as a whole, I keep coming back to this scene because it feels like the genesis of an ethereality that permeates the experience. See, even after BJ awakens to joyously cut a Nazi throat, the world he awakens to feels like a mere extension of his previous mental state. Both time and place are hazy, characters come and go and die, you flit between scenarios and never really get a full grasp on what's happening. In a word, and I didn't think I'd be saying this about a Wolfenstein game, it's dreamlike. Now, dreams turn out to be a key theme throughout the experience. I mean, it literally opens with BJ being jolted awake from his vision of a more peaceful existence. The beauty and importance of this theme, however, come from the fact that its presentation goes beyond the surface level. It's made apparent through cinematography, scene transitions, as well as the game's handling of mechanics, genre and temporality. In short, it's everywhere. It became clear to me, for example, in the way BJ and Anya suddenly jolt from the train that they're on to that train's destination. Not only is it a drastic tonal shift from their brief moment of romantic joy to the grim reality of their situation, it occurs with such a flash that it genuinely made me question whether or not it actually happened, if BJ had merely conjured it. It got me asking questions about other parts of the scene which share equally jarring contrasts. We go from mercilessly slaughtering an entire Nazi checkpoint to simply getting coffee on a train in a few brief moments. A train with high-ranking Nazi officials on it who apparently had no idea that many of their colleagues had just been brought down by a single man. Hell, with the amount of Nazi killing BJ has done over the years, surely he'd be the stuff of legend at this point. But nope, he just happens to be on a train with a high-ranking official and no one bats an eyelid. It reminded me of that scene from Inception where Cobb states, you never really remember the beginning of a dream, you always end up right in the middle of what's going on. And in the same way as Inception, thinking about the implications of that in Wolfenstein shatters the illusion somewhat. All the weird temporal jumps that occur, from BJ sneaking into a concentration camp, or stealing an officer's uniform and just appearing on the moon entirely undetected, all have you asking, just how did I suddenly appear in this situation? It's a question that's never really answered, it doesn't matter, you don't need the details. You can try to piece things together as you go along through newspaper clippings and the like, but who cares about details when you're there to kill Nazis? It all serves to give time and space this weirdly hazy feeling, where you question what's real and what's not, like you're sleepwalking into situations because as BJ you are just there to kill Nazis and as a player you're doing whatever the protagonist has been sent to do. You just do it, even if you have as much of an understanding of the context as BJ does. It's a haziness that's reflected in cutscenes, where not only does soft focus give the literal appearance of haze, but also whose composition often goes against cinematic tradition in order to create distance from a situation. It's apparent in the way the shaky camera floats around, creating a lot of lead space that you expect to be filled, but has the characters focusing the opposite direction. Cuts are sudden and often land on shots that don't give you a full picture of a scene, closing in on characters using canted angles to highlight instability. But I repeat, who cares about this stuff when you're there to kill Nazis? 
yes, I get that, and this endeavour is made hugely cathartic due to its grindhouse presentation, where BJ is a walking tank of a man blasting through these hordes with hulking shotguns akimbo, taking the world back from the Nazis, except he's not really a walking tank, is he? You go down surprisingly quickly if you're not racing between health packs, dual wielding weapons isn't that much more effective than just holding one and takes double the ammo, and most importantly, the Nazis are everywhere, they feel endless at times. Now this is a franchise that helped define the notion of bombast in first person shooters, and this instalment very much foregrounds that idea. However, what feels equally as satisfying, what saves ammo, health and ultimately time, is treating it like a tactical stealth shooter. It's yet another disconnect that serves to distance you as a player from the realities you have come to know regarding mechanics and genre. In short, it's safe to say that it's a fairly destabilising experience. The question then remains though, why do this? Why heighten this sense of surreality in a game about killing Nazis? Because, and bear with me here, I don't actually think the game is about defeating the Nazis. It's not trying to dictate to you the horrors of war or that Nazis are bad, it presumes you're a decent human being who knows these things. The game is very deliberately setting them up as incongruous, as not only the victors, but as something so bewilderingly monolithic, I mean BJ can't even escape them by leaving Earth, that taking the world back from them feels genuinely impossible. Ultimately, how can you destroy something whose scale you have no means of understanding? And so emerges the central premise of the New Order. The Nazis here are the extinction event in The Road. They are the indefinable apocalypse after which we find our characters. And like all good post-apocalyptic fiction, the focus is not on finding a way to undo that apocalypse, it's about magnifying the personalities of the characters surviving its consequences. The Nazis are here, how do BJ and friends assert their existence in the face of that? For example, when BJ and Anya are presumably trying for a baby, he tells her that he wants it like this. It's a positive sentiment that he's found someone so important to him that he's willing to brave starting a family even under these dire circumstances. But there's that subtle and painful acknowledgement that like this will always be like this, that they'll never be able to fully change things. It's a really raw moment, but the game is full of those moments, from Fergus or Wyatt dealing with their survivor complex, or Jay navigating his conflicting feelings about BJ as a person versus his place within an imperialist framework. These moments cut to the core of the characters, of their values, in ways that simply would not be possible if one could just defeat the enemy. By subverting norms of genre, cinematography and temporality in order to distance BJ from reality, the game is able to place you in his dreamlike world, one that frames him as a human being rather than a righteous killing machine, and one that does so by framing your goal as a player as somewhat inherently unwinnable. As such, the game turns what could have been a needlessly preachy take on the horrors of war into a deeply personal, surprisingly affecting character study. So I hope you enjoyed my piece on Wolfenstein The New Order. If you want to keep up with future videos, why not hit subscribe as well as checking out the podcast in the description. If you really feel like going the extra mile however, you can always support my Patreon like these beautiful people currently on screen. Your support absolutely makes this show possible and I cannot thank you enough for it. In particular, I'd like to thank Julian McRoth, Spike Jones, Brandon Robinson, Diego Fox Obuza, Justin's Holderness, James Doring, Biggie Smith, Mark B. Writing, Peter, Artyom Vitsyuk, Christian Kuneman, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, I'm Hamish Black and this has been Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.